right. Awesome. I hope everyone's been having a great conference so far. I know I have been learning a ton. Uh, so I'm excited to, to continue it with this session and continue it even more tomorrow. Let's get started. So hi, I'm your moderator, Rosie Capron. Uh, welcome to launching Next Generation of Essential Skills uh, with Casey Trowbridge, who leads our global education programs team here at Adobe. Uh, I'm excited to, to hand it off to her so she can tell you a bit about how to set your students up for success. Thanks thank for being here today, Tacey. Oh, thank you so much, Rosie. I'm obviously really excited to be here and to talk to folks. It's been fascinating to dip into some of the sessions and to see the conversation as well as just the topics that are being discussed. What I'm going to do today is talk to you about some of the research that Adobe has been doing around essential skills who values them, what they are. And so I'll just share our research, give you a sense of where we're headed, uh, and let you hear from some educators. But first of all, let's see if I can get my slide to advance. There we go. Uh, so I'm Casey Trowbridge. Um, and for those of you who haven't met me before, I'm an educator. I started my career as a classroom teacher, worked in K-12 and the higher education systems. And I am really excited about helping learners wherever they are, whatever they're learning, and really empowering them with critical skills and essential skills. My role at Adobe is I lead our advocacy and our global thought leadership work for the education team. I also look after our certification programs. And I'm really excited today just to share with you what we're doing and how we're, we are looking into the ways in which we can best prepare the next generation for success. I gave you a quick overview, but I'll just tell you again that first we're going to look at some of the importance and the impact of essential creative and digital literacy skills, highlight some ideas from educators, reflections, advice, and then share some resources if you'd like to learn more and dive into some of the research in greater detail or hear more from the educators that I'll be highlighting in this session. So first of all, the key question. What skills prepare students for success in a changing world? I think this last year has only underscore, underscored the importance of really in, in focusing on the most important, the right kinds of things as we're engaging with students. Uh, particularly when there's any kind of large disruption, it forces you to ask yourself, what's the purpose? What am I really trying to do here? And as I look at some of the ways in which people have been answering those questions, increasingly there's a focus on what can I do to help my students be successful in my classroom today and as they go forward. Adobe is often scanning the landscape. We look to see what are other people saying about the skills that matter. Uh, we, this, is a, this is from the World Economic Forum. We pay close attention to LinkedIn, The Economist. Uh, Google often has announcements. IBM has done interesting research. So we're looking at who's doing research about the critical skills for tomorrow. Most of these lists have a lot of commonalities. They're focused on skills that really help address the future workforce. So complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity as being skills that are really key in a world that's changing rapidly, where it's hard to have every to learn everything you need to know for your job before you start it. More than likely, the world is going to continue to change and you'll need to adapt. And so we see a real focus on essential skills, what we call the five C's, communication, creativity, critical thinking, creative problem solving and creativity as skills that will really help students continue to adapt as they move into their futures. We also do research with our students to understand, do they value these kinds of skills? And we, we conducted this study initially uh, several years ago, five years ago, and then did it again in 2020 to understand if anything had changed. Students absolutely see creativity and they see these skills as critical for their success. They see it as critical for their personal success and also for the success of our society, of our world. They also think they learn best when, they're, when they are creating and they wish there was more of a focus on creativity in their classrooms. Educators agree. They see that these skills are critically important for students. They think it's likely to set their students up for uh, longer careers where they won't be as impacted by automation and then also for careers that allow for advancement uh, and that position students for higher paying roles. 
We also hear from educators that unfortunately it's really hard to nurture these skills in schools today. And that's not because educators don't want to. When we ask about some of the barriers, they talk about things like lack of professional development or a rigid curriculum or not having the right kinds of schedule and structures that support teaching these kinds of skills. We also have done research to understand employers and what they're seeking. We looked at 2 million resumes, 2 million job postings, and did a crosswalk, to, a crosswalk analysis to understand what are the skills that are being highlighted in each places. And this struck us as a, as a particularly important moment. It's not the only way in which someone applies for a job, but certainly a resume is key, and it allowed us to do this broad analysis. We targeted, uh, we targeted high growth career fields. So these were everything from data science to medicine to construction to education, all fields that were growing rapidly. We wanted to understand what are the skills that matter. We also conducted a qualitative component of this research where we did in-depth interviews with hiring managers, with, uh, with, with um, career leaders within institutions to, have, have, to get their guidance on what they understood from this research. We focused on five creative and essential skill sets on, on the five C's that we discussed previously. These are the ones that have shown up both in terms of what industry is reporting and then are also clearly an important focus in education. What we saw in looking at the job postings was that most of the job postings referenced communication or creativity or both. Frankly, three quarters of the job postings were looking for communication and creativity. When we looked at the resumes, there was a large gap in terms of what was featured in resumes. Only 25% or 24% featured creativity and even fewer communication. Three and four resumes didn't even mention either creativity or communication skills. When we talked to employers about this, one of the things they highlighted is that students too often think when they're applying for their first job that they should focus on their hard skills. And one woman in particular who hires data scientists was concerned that the resume she saw didn't include the skills that would help someone be successful when, when they actually entered these roles. So they didn't feature the ways in which they would help solve problems. They would learn something new. They'd be able to communicate with their peers or potentially with customers. And so she saw this gap as really significant, particularly interesting given that her field is one where the hard sciences, the hard data really matters, but the, without the soft skills, the hard skills aren't as useful. So this raised some interesting questions for us about how do we close this skills gap? If there's broad agreement that these are the skills that are important, but we know educators struggle to find the right kinds of support to be able to, to teach these kinds of skills across the board commonly. There are obviously some outstanding folks doing this work and you all are most likely already doing this. But as we look broadly across whole systems, this is one of the challenges. Uh, we also see there's a gap in terms of equity, the kinds of experience that different students have based on their economic background, their access to education, that is more personalized, that allows room for them to develop creativity. We see important gaps in terms of equity and access to these skills. And I think for us, we're interested in how do we solve these? How do we solve this? How do we close these gaps? If students reported want that they learn best by creating, they also told us that they only spend between seven and 10% of their time in doing creative activities in the classroom. So as we're diving further into this, I'm going to start to share with you some of the work that we're doing that's coming. So one thing we've done uh, is partner with LinkedIn, and we are about to release a really interesting analysis about uh, young people who are just entering their first career. So early in their career, just out of school, does do, do these kinds of skills matter? And so LinkedIn looked at lots of different profiles. They uh, well. I don't know how many they looked at, but that we'll be sharing that information as we share the whole study. But they looked across all of all sorts of profiles to understand what's the difference between people who have creative skills and are applying for jobs and people who don't include creative skills in their LinkedIn profile. What we saw is that the rate of hiring has grown for people with creative skills, particularly this following spring, this pre previous spring from January to May when compared to the same time period in 2019. 
that's an interesting one. It's not that surprising, given that we've also seen a growth in creative industries. We've seen tremendous adaptation and change within industries. So folks who are hiring are looking for people who can manage change, who can help navigate change, come up with solutions to new problems. Uh, but it's an exciting one to see is that this is an area where hiring has grown. And again, this is across the board. This is not just in creative industries, but this is really looking quite broadly uh, at anyone who's applying for a job who fits it within this early career category and applying to any job that's, that uh, is visible. Then what we've also seen is that creative skills help applicants earn more, that they are paid up to 18% more when they're entering the workforce. And this, again, will varied across different, uh, different, different career fields, but it was clear that there was an increase uh, in terms of how much money an applicant was able to make when they first applied for a job. Then we were interested in the next phase of this, which is understanding what happens next. So you've gotten your first job, you're hired, you've been able to negotiate a good salary, then are you likely to get promoted or to advance? And we saw that recent graduates with creative skills were twice as likely to be promoted in the, in the previous 18 months. They were twice as likely to have um, increased their position, to have more seniority, or to have obtained an advanced degree. So we'll be releasing this study uh, in the fall, likely in mid-September. So stay tuned and look for the details of this. This is really just a sneak preview. Uh, and we'll be sharing more details about this. Uh, and I think it's just a really interesting study to help us understand what, what really matters and how can we help prepare students for this. Then tied to this study is another one. This is one we've done with three of our creative campus institutions. These are higher education institutions who've adopted Creative Cloud across their campus. And they, they want to understand, and we're really interested in understanding, what's the impact? Does this matter for students and help prepare them as they move forward within their academic career? So through a partnership with Civitas, who ran this research for us, we sponsored the research, but Civitas conducted a huge data analysis where they pulled data from three different institutions, the University of Texas San Antonio, Cal State Fullerton, and East Tennessee State to understand for students that had access to Creative Cloud, to learning creative skills, to digital literacy in their classrooms, what impact did it have? The early results are really fascinating and we're still diving through all the data, the data and putting together the final report. But what we're seeing is that there's a, there's a statistically significant increase in course mastery for the particular course that students were engaged in. We're seeing a greater number of A and B grades, particularly from students who it was expected might not do as well in this class. So that's an increase in terms of their grades. We're also seeing long-term increased persistence where students are more likely to continue their studies as we've looked at this over several years to understand what's the impact for a student, particularly in a class, what's the impact across their grades within the time period that they're enrolled, and then looking at their enrollment over time. And we looked at data uh, spanning back into 20 to early 2020. So it's sort of an interesting time to do this research, but it gave us some real insight into what's the impact of learning these kinds of skills for students and the value for the students themselves and for the institution as well. So stay tuned, we will, I'm really excited to share this research in greater detail. Uh, we've seen some interesting results, particularly for traditionally underserved or underrepresented students, saw some of the greatest increases in terms of their persistence, in terms of course mastery. So we'll be excited to share the details. We'll also be highlighting some of the classes that particularly seem to drive this. At each institution, there were courses that were um, that seemed to have a real impact on their students. And so we'll dive more into understanding what is it that those instructors were doing? What were, how were they teaching? How were they preparing their students in ways that gave them such an important increase in these different measures? So I, what I hope is clear is that in order to succeed in this complex world, students, students need creative and they need digital literacy skills. And they need to be able to show those through performance. Our research on resumes indicated that students may not be aware of how important it is to highlight these skills, even if they have them. 
And if they have these skills, they may not know how to show them. And so I think we've got a number of different challenges to face as we think about how to close the skills gap and ensure that students not only have access to learning the important, the important creative and digital literacy skills, but that they know how to showcase them and they understand their importance and their significance. We're also starting to see ways in which not just individual educators, and we've certainly seen that in spades over the years, but in ways in which educational systems can really help cultivate these important skills and provide students with a greater step up as they enter the workforce, uh, as they've mastered these kinds of skills to be able to demonstrate them, to be able to be hired more quickly, to be able to uh, hire, be hired at a higher salary and to have in their early part of their career greater opportunities for advancement. I want to share uh, some perspectives from educators who uh, we've worked with in a, in a number of different ways. Uh, these are educators who've been part of our online courses. They've been part of our podcast series. And so I want to share some of their perspectives with you almost as a teaser, as an insight into who, some, who these folks are. Some of you may know them well. They're, they're active members of our community and fantastic leaders. I wanted to share some of their perspectives with you. And I'll, I'll start with Stephen Marshall. Stephen's a professor at East Tennessee State University and for years has been teaching really interesting series of marketing classes that prepare his students to enter the workforce. He talks about launching his student career, his students into their careers. And so he gives them opportunities to participate in real world, world projects. They work on teams, they've got a client, They've got to figure out how to take on and address client work and solve problems as they come up. And so they're taking some of the concepts that they learn in, in his class and applying them in the real world and learning in real time. That worked, that didn't work, how to pivot, how to adapt. He's got a great quote that to be a great communicator, to be a great collaborator, this should be taught across discipline. It's relevant where who, whatever career you're going into, whatever you're studying. And so this focus on skills that transcend some of the traditional disciplines is a really critical piece. He also works hard at helping his students differentiate themselves so that when they're presenting, whether they're doing a Zoom interview for the first time, that they've got what they need to present themselves professionally, to demonstrate what they know and can do. He has his students participate in certification, in competitions, in anything that will externally validate that students have these skills in a way in which they can actively uh, deploy them as they get started in, in a new field. So his students will take the Adobe Certified uh, Professional Certifications as a way to demonstrate to employers that they've got skills that, that will help them be successful. Then they also have a portfolio of work that they've done as they've completed a real world project for a client. Stephen participated in uh, one of our free Adobe Education Exchange courses which is about essential skills uh, that launch, that's launched student careers. So you can hear more directly from him there. He also participated in the Creative Educator podcast with one of his former students, both reflecting on what are the ways in which uh, he, Stephen helped prepare the student as he moved forward, what were the things that really mattered to the student. It's a great interview and I encourage you to check it out. Then I also wanted to highlight Michael Hernandez, who is also one of the speakers in this course and has participated in the podcast as well. Michael's classroom is really interesting, and I think his reflections on this past year and the kinds of assignments, the ways in which he adapted was, was really compelling. Uh, he focuses on digital storytelling. He runs student-centered classes. He thinks really carefully about ways to assess student work and that are meaningful to them. Um, he leverages technology in, in very powerful ways, bringing experts into his class and engaging with students uh, and thinking about how can, how can students really do work that has an impact on their communities. Uh, he talked about some of the work that students were doing during COVID as being partly just processing and trying, trying to figure out what was happening in their world and reporting and sharing on that. It was also about connecting with other people. Uh, he was talking about a photography project, a portrait project he had students do. And if you can imagine, and many of you probably tried to do this, but if you can imagine trying to take a portrait of someone at a distance when you can't actually be in the same space, that it was the students ended up teaching people how to take a self-portrait and how to frame that to help tell a story. And he's one of the things he talks about is his excitement about 
the way a global pandemic has really challenged us to rethink what we're doing, to think about how we teach, to focus on what's important, um, and to think about how can we help our students learn. I, I love this, this particular quote where he talks about, for him, this was really an opportunity to experiment, to share, to help others, to listen, and for many of the other educators in his school. Lisa Gottfried uh, is a project-based learning, uh, she's not just a practitioner, she's an expert. Uh, she works at New Tech High in Napa, which is an entirely project-based school. Her students draw, also drive projects for real clients, and these are her high school students. So they, uh, she has them not just do work on a project, but drive the project. Students take on different roles. Some are project managers. Uh, some are actually doing some of the design work but they have to work together to solve these real challenges. And Lisa's advice is that if you're thinking about teaching these critical skills, the best thing to do it is to create a learning environment where you have to use them, where they're not optional or a nice to have or being woven in, but they're critical. And so you can see for students who are driving their own projects, they have to communicate effectively. They have to collaborate in order to be able to do this work. They need to be creative problem solvers to think critically and to leverage their creativity. Uh, she ties this idea about creating learning environments to assessment and talks about learning as being this process of really pr important productive struggle. Uh, if it's easy, you're not learning as much as you could be. And she talks about the traditional forms of assessment as transitional as, or transactional grading. Uh, and what she really encourages folks to do is think about how you can assess in ways that create pro productive struggle, or not just plain struggle, <laughs> but are actually productive in teaching something. And so looking at assessment and seeing assessment as a tool, a way in which you can help really give the important kinds of feedback that will help students learn and grow, uh, rather than just a letter grade that um, is a, a specific transaction. Student hands in the work, teacher grades it, hands it back. But this kind of assessment really should be about how do you help students move and develop their skills. And then finally, Al Thomas, who I'm, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that Lisa is also featured as one of the speakers in this course, the Education Exchange course, so is Al. Um, Al comes from a really great background. He's done tremendous work as a teacher, a principal, as a technology lead, currently working with ISTE. Uh, his advice in, that I thought added to this whole presentation is essentially about being vulnerable. It's about encouraging teachers to create opportunities and space for students to see them developing their own creative skills, that this isn't something that we stop doing. These are skills that we continue to develop over time. And as an educator, you have a tremendous opportunity to model this for your students and to share with them uh, some of the processes that you use, the ways in which you adapt and change, I have to say last year, I don't know an educator that wasn't innovating on the fly. And I think one of the really powerful experiences that we all had uh, was the opportunity and in fact the mandate to try new things, that the, we, we couldn't do things the way we'd done them previously. We also had to be vulnerable in learning publicly uh, and, and making mistakes publicly, engaging with our students in different ways. As I think about both the research and what we're seeing, this, what we know about the important skills, and then also our opportunity as we begin a new school year in North America, uh, certainly enter a new season, is that we have a chance to really ask the important questions. Are we doing the right kinds of things? Are we teaching the students the right skills? How do all of the touch points, all of the things that we're doing for, with students help prepare them for their futures? Whether that's through the kinds of assessments, whether that's through instructional practices, whether that's through the projects that students are working on. We have these tremendous opportunities to help prepare students for a changing world. And I think that's, a, that's an incredibly important mission for educators. I wanted to also just give you some next steps, places you could go if you've got, if you wanna dive in and learn a little bit more, either about the research or some of these educators and their practices. And so first I'll share this course, Preparing Students with Essential Creative Skills. This is free, uh, it is, you can take it at your own time, you can explore, dip in. All of the videos included in this are posted on our YouTube channel, so if you wanted to include them in a professional development session for that you're doing at your school that might be focused on assessment or focused on looking at projects for K, in K-12 or 
hearing from higher education educators reflecting on how they teach these skills. We'd certainly encourage you to, to use them. They're available and set up that way. Then we launched a creative educator podcast, and this is one of the places where I learned a lot this year. Uh, I'd never done a podcast before and decided to do it broadcasting from my uh, from a room in my house, trying to figure out how do I get the right audio? How do I make sure that everything's working well? Learning to conduct interviews and doing it quite publicly. Uh, I think one of the particularly memorable moments was um, I was interviewing um, a reporter from the from the Chronicle of Higher Education, fabulous man uh, who lives in Washington, D.C., and I was interviewing him on the day the Capitol was stormed in the midst of all of that. And so we were trying to figure out how do we stay focused on the conversation that we're having and pay attention to what's happening in the world. That was, for me, a microcosm of a moment of really having to focus and make decisions around what I could control, what I could pay attention to in a particular time. And it served as a bit of a metaphor for me about the experience that we all had with the world changing rapidly around us in ways that were sometimes frightening, uh, sometimes very serious, and to be able to keep a focus on the things that we could control, the things that we could do, um, was, was an important lesson for me. But more importantly about the podcast are the educators. They're a fantastic group of interviews this year from Stephen Marshall, uh, from a collection of educators, five educators reflecting on their experience over the last year and talking about what they're hopeful for in the future. Uh, just a great collection of podcast episodes. So take a listen. If you've got an idea or something you think we should feature, I'd love to hear from you. So reach out to me and let us know if there's something that you're doing that would be really interesting to explore in this format. And then finally, I invite you to join us uh, for Adobe Max for at Adobe Max. We are hosting a series of education sessions within this huge creativity conference. This is the largest creativity conference in the world. Uh, it's free, it's, a, it's virtual, so you can attend at any time. The sessions will be available afterwards, so you could right now go and watch the sessions from last year. But we've got some fantastic sessions coming up uh, for this year's Max, and look forward to seeing you there. So I want to thank you. I hope that these some of these resources are helpful to you. And I'll pause now and uh, see if there are any questions that you have. Rosie, I'm going to need to stop sharing. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. I thank you for the comment that um, that so, without soft skills, there are no critical skills. I think that's absolutely right. And that certification makes students feel successful. I, you know, that's, I think, a really important point. As we've done some of our research about what helps students feel successful, we, we're also realizing that confidence matters a lot. And so giving them the confidence, that, that's probably obvious to you, but I think to see it show up in the research was really interesting that student confidence that they had the right kinds of skills, that they knew how to do a project, that they had experience engaging with the kinds of technologies that they'll use in the workforce, gave them confidence to apply for a job, confidence as they started a new job, and gave them a leg up um, and made it easier for them to advance. I know we're at the end of our time, and I want to thank you for joining me. It's been a pleasure to be able to share some of this work for you with you, and uh, stay tuned. We've got some exciting research coming up uh, that you'll see uh, coming out uh, in mid-September. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tacey, for taking the time to, to share. This is really insightful, and, and I hope really helpful for everyone who was able to attend today. Um, everyone, I want to thank you for taking the time to, to learn, to chime in. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed the conference so far. I know that if you head to the learning lobby now, there's going to be, I think, a kind of reflection session to wrap up the day. Uh, and of course, plenty of good stuff tomorrow as well. Uh, so on that note, enjoy the reflection uh, and thank you for joining us. We hope to see you at the rest of the conference.